Hi, my name's Anna Saren, and I'm Director of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. You're joining us today for a very special market recap. I am joined by special co-host, James Black. Welcome, James. Wow. Uh, thanks for having me today. It's uh, it's a pleasure to finally be here uh, from outside of the, behind the camera, if I guess if that's what you want to call it, and in front of the camera. I usually help out with the back end, but today I'm uh, helping with the front end. So James, this is very timely that we're doing this together this week because it was five years ago this week that you hired me. Can you believe that? Yeah, every, I, I, every day I count my blessings. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> it's, it's live. You heard it here, people. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't look at it that way, but yeah, five years, it's incredible. We've worked together that, that long. A lot has happened in five years. Um, you know, I, I don't remember how many listings we had at the CSE five years ago, but uh, it's certainly isn't close. <laughs> how many? We had 301 companies. What do we have today? Uh, we almost have 700 listings, 700 listings. It's That's all due to me, obviously. <laughs> I mean, yeah, correlation. We talk a lot about, uh, you know, market dynamics on this show. Unfortunately, today, because Bruce isn't here, you're not going to hear as many intelligent things, at least from this side of the screen. But um yeah, certainly, uh, if we could draw some correlation, if we could show a little a graph that we sometimes show, and it gets hired five years ago, listings goes up. Uh, if you could invest in the CSE as a company, <laughs> that would have been the best time to get in. So, <laughs> Well, and, and I do have to put a shout out to our whole team. We have an amazing team, and everyone works so hard for all the success that has happened, um, and I feel very lucky myself. Now, let's get to the market. It is, uh, obviously, Bruce is not joining us this week, so it is James Black and myself. James is VP of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. How many years have you been here, James? Uh, it's hard. I, I can't even say it with a straight face. I've almost been here 12 years. Oh my God. You look like you're 13. How is that possible? I haven't done anything for 12 years and I've been here for 12 years. So. <laughs> um, okay. Listen, there was lots going on this week, some fun stuff. So with Bruce gone, I feel like the kids can play. We can talk about some fun stuff. Um, uh, El Salvador, it, mm. uh, it, is set to accept Bitcoin as a currency. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about Robinhood. It's going public. There's a bunch of stuff happening there. Uh, we're going to talk about, um, for a bunch of CSC stuff going on, we're going to touch on plant-based sector. Uh, we're going to talk about esports, and we're going to talk about some CSC celebrity sightings, um, some pretty exciting celebrity ambassadorships that are coming to the CSC. We've talked about a bunch of them with Bruce um, over the past few months, and there's more. So we're going to talk about those. Let's start with El Salvador. So El Salvador came out this week is set to accept Bitcoin as a tender within the country. So a few things on El Salvador. I'll, I'll start off with just giving you a few a few few um, facts about this whole thing. So first of all, El Salvador does not have its own currency. It uses U.S. currency. Um, so I, I found that interesting. That's probably the reason that they're making this move is po potentially a little bit more independence that way. Um, Naib Bukel, Bukeli. I don't know if I'm saying his last name right. He is the president. He is younger than me. Um, so good for him. He's obviously younger than me. <laughs> He's not younger than you. He's just younger than me. Thanks for pointing that out. James. <laughs> oh, no. It's not a huge gap. Ahead, sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, so he came out this this past um, this past through the government this week. He came out. He is known for his Twitter activity. Um, he's very active on Twitter. He's a young guy. He came out. He put laser eyes on, which apparently is a meme that people use around the Bitcoin world, um, and said that they'll use it. Um, so they don't have their own currency. Apparently, seventy percent of the country doesn't have access to to traditional financial services. And that's one of the reasons for this. Um, he also, uh, I thought this was interesting. He's instructed state owned geothermal electric firm um, to develop a plan to offer Bitcoin mining facilities using renewable energy, using the country's volcanoes. Um, you can't make this stuff up. That's so they're going to use Bitcoin and they're going to mine it with their volcanoes. Amazing. Um, I did just out of curiosity, look up the size of El Salvador. It is the size as new, same as New Jersey. That's how big it is. And it only has six and a half million population. One final fact I want to bring up before, um, I ask you your opinion on this, James. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I found really interesting is he has come out and said, if anyone invests 
three Bitcoin in El Salvador, um, you would be entitled to a permanent residency. So just to put this in perspective, three Bitcoin, if you're looking at that price right now, that's about 120000 uh, $150,000, and you can become a permanent resident in El Salvador. Um, I thought this was especially interesting because I don't know if you remember, but a few weeks back, I was talking to Bruce about how the Oakland A's came out and offered a season's suite, a box for one Bitcoin. At the time, that one Bitcoin Bitcoin was 68,000. I, for some reason, found this interesting. <laughs> so you could get choices. Do I want to get season <laughs> tickets at a baseball park or do I want to spend a little more and become the resident of El exactly. Salvador? Right? Exactly. That's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> okay. Tell me what you think about this. <laughs> well, I, I don't have like a very nuanced opinion. I, I was actually skimming through some materials. Uh, one place I got some ideas from was uh, Genevieve Rock Dector's uh, Grit Newsletter. Um, I think she's pro Bitcoin, but you know, I guess what I look at the situation as is, is you hit the nail on the head with the population. This is like, um, uh, not a, it's a bit of noise for sure. It's, it's a, obviously it's a nation state, it's a country and they've implemented this as legal tender. You can go buy coffee with it. You can go buy anything that you can use the U S dollar for. So that's, that's a big deal from that perspective, but it's just not a big country. So it, from that perspective, it's, it's a lot of noise, but it did have a huge impact on the Bitcoin price, it looks like you see that dip on the chart there. You can see that was the eighth, and then today it's it's up uh, quite a bit. That was thirty seven thousand Canadian, roughly now forty four thousand Canadian, and I think a lot of that was because of this news. So uh, makes you again probably get a little queasy if you look at volatility and look at you know that B BTC is still a speculative currency. It can be moved by relatively. Um, you know, innocuous news or, or noise in the market. So this guy's kind of cool. He wore the background hat, back, backwards hat in the photo and he's, you know, he's Twittering, he's got laser eyes. That's, that's amazing. But uh, how seriously should we take it? And and so if you're going to go on the other side of the equation, you're pro Bitcoin, you, you think this is a good signal. It's that this could be the first domino. This is the first step into legitimacy as a, as a currency, as a base currency. Uh, but I, I think you mentioned it's not going to change their base currency. They're not going base currency BTC, it's going to be base currency US dollars still. So they're still being backed by fiat currency, which is obviously one of the, it's the strongest currency in the world. So it's cool. It's a good news. It's a good story. I think if you're bullish in Bitcoin, it's it's a it's a very positive development. But if you're if you look at what happened on the chart because of this at the price, perhaps you just go and fortify your opinion that this is far too speculative to be considered a true currency and you just walk away and, and wait for this whole thing to end or, or blow up or whatever. Uh, so I don't have a strong opinion either way, but but I think it, it it just proves that this is a very interesting phenomenon and things like this can move the market almost instantly. Well, OK, so and you touched on a really good point there. Um, I think I'm fairly conservative when it comes to these cryptocurrencies and, and it could just be my own greenness with dealing with cryptocurrencies. But I, I feel nervous when um, the CEO of a public company, Elon Musk, can come out and say something about it and it changes the price. And then, you know, this news happens with this young president comes out and he's implementing this and it changes. That makes me nervous. I mean, it there's something about it. I'm the jury's out for me on how I feel about cryptocurrencies, but it's obviously here to stay. Right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to move along. There is a potential big IPO coming, Robinhood. We've talked about Robinhood so much this year. Robinhood really came to light as the pandemic happened. Everyone was locked into their house and they could um, they could trade, free trades um, on Robinhood. We have um, a counterpart, uh, they're not associated, but in Canada, it's called Well Simple. I'm sure you've heard of one or the other. Robinhood is set to to do an IPO. So this is what Robinhood has done. Um, and this is kind of interesting to me. Uh, maybe it's standard. I don't know when they're big ones like this, but they've filed a confidential IPO. And what this means is that they don't have to discuss the, um, the filing itself and what's in the filing um, until 15 days before they start their roadshow or before they go public. Um, now, for those of you that don't know what it takes for a company to go public, the filing is massive. Um, for a company this size, I can only imagine how big that prospectus is. James, can you, can you imagine? <laughs> I, you know, I'm a one pager type of guy. So yeah. Really so these filings, yeah. yeah. And it's disclosure on everything in the company. Um, so what do you think? What do you think about this company going public? 
Yeah, I mean, it was inevitable, obviously, and it's going to have huge ramifications for other companies. So Robinhood is going to go public, I believe, at a $40 billion uh, value. And that's obviously huge. Um, it, it puts it into some unique uh, <laughs> uh, fellows uh, fellowship in, in the world of public companies this year. Now, the ramifications here for Canada, what I really want to focus on is just well simple, right? So they raised $750 million just a couple months ago. We talked about it on the show. Um, what these people ultimately want to do at Robinhood and Simple is own a new generation of banking. They don't want to just kind of chip away at the banks and get you know a few counts here, a few counts there. They want to own, just like the current bank, um, Ogliopoli, as I call it in Canada, does in Canada, they pretty much across the five of them, five major banks in Canada, you know, you could consider it six if you throw national. But the point being is they have everybody. And I think these people think they can get after uh, a large chunk of the new, you know, millennials, post millennials uh, for financial services. So this is about ownership of uh, a relationship, not just being able to get, you know, sell basically trades to people through their discounters. That's that's a big part of it. So I think that what we're going to see here is um, uh, another huge uh, valuation coming for well, simple when they do, in fact, go public. And there is no there is no prospectus out for them. They haven't made any statements as far as I know, other than when you raise 750 million bucks, those investors want to get their money back out and they want to get it out at a higher value. So this could really you know tip their hand and say, here's a comparable in the US and Canada. For well simple, this could be a huge sign for them to say, "Okay, we're ready to go." And uh, again, it's going to further give them ammunition to to go after these new customers, open up new lines of business uh, like mortgages, lending, um, and basically take on the banks who are just swimming in cash. They're like Scrooge McDuck swimming vaults of cash right now. They're making so much money; they just they literally have to give away to their shareholders as dividends, which is not a bad thing. But it's uh, it's <laughs> yeah. the banks are doing great. Um, I was quite surprised when I was reading about Well Simple because uh, Bruce and I talked about it a few weeks ago, and you mentioned they did a seven hundred and fifty million dollar raise with um, a bunch of celebrity Canadian celebrity names. I think Michael J. Fox, Ryan Reynolds. Uh, there was a bunch of other people in there um, invested in it, and I was also surprised to find out they also offer you the ability to do your tax returns. It really for the next generation has become it'll become your one stop you know financial shop. Um, one thing I do want to mention on that note, because this is interesting. So, uh, Robinhood just recently, so first of all, on Thursday, they had to rush out and they had to come up with a billion dollars, um, as their clearinghouse demanded more collateral for all the attempted short squeezes that are going on. That's a lot of money to have to rush out and grab a billion dollars. So, um, you know, it makes me wonder about that 750 million that was raised. These companies, um, when the short squeezes happen, uh, the clearinghouse will say, you need to have this much cash, um, you know, for what's on the book. So um, they, they're, they require a lot of capital. Um, but also they just settled $65 million in December. Um, there were allegations that they failed to properly disclose how they're making their money to their clients. Um, and, and we talked about that a bit earlier, James, neither of us feel qualified enough to really explain it, but because you're not paying commissions, there's lots of other ways that these companies are making their money. Yeah. Um, and maybe we'll talk next about week pay for order flow in a future show. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. We'll get into that. Um, mm -hmm. but, but also they're, they're being probed right now in Massachusetts by the the regulators because um, the regulators are saying, look, you're gamifying um, investing. And so it'll be really interesting because I think the one thing that's really important as these companies look to go public, um, the disclosure required for public companies is immense, especially these bigger companies. So um, it'll be interesting to, I think Robinhood will definitely lead the path for, well, simple, either in a good or a bad way, right? I mean, it, you know, these companies, uh, again, these companies aren't going anywhere. And I think it'll be the new way of doing things. But the regulators definitely have their finger on the pulse saying, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we're not sure how we feel about this, but we're going to be making sure that we're watching everything that's going on. Do you perhaps think the regulators sometimes hang out with the bankers and talk and maybe have conversations about certain things like competition? Like it's a just private the banks. regulator banker club. <laughs> I'm just saying the banks, the banks aren't oh, yeah. going to give it up that easily. Okay. They're slower yeah. for sure, but they have immense resources and, and weight within the system to to make sure that things work to their, their liking. So I'm not calling conspiracy. I'm just saying in Canada, we protect our banks. They're great, uh, you know, bastions of, <laughs> um, 
you know, capitalism, they do a lot of things really well. And they're also well, well respected and protected by government. They're not going to be able to just give it away. They're just not going to yeah. happen that way. So just totally. don't forget that. Yeah. Don't forget. You heard it here. Okay. Let's talk about some CSC issuers. Um, because James is here today, we wanted to focus. This is a special edition on a bunch of our amazing companies. We've had such a crazy year so far. Um, tell us what's happened so far with the CSC, James, this year. Yeah. The, I, I'm a, it's hard to keep track. Uh, so I'll just <laughs> let me tease you, everyone, that we are going to put out some semi-annual results fairly soon, interviews with our CEO, a lot of great information if you really want to sink your teeth into things. Uh, but this has been an exciting year. Just these last two months, so April, May, we had over 20 companies per month list on the exchange, or 20 listings, I should say. So that's over 40 new listings to look at and, and uh, try to share those stories with you today. Uh, so I looked at a few themes, and one of the themes I want to talk about today was comfort food, uh, specific, specifically that which is plant-based. So we had a couple new entrants to the exchange, Como and Bush. Uh, it's Como and Bush. And they both do comfort foods like lasagnas, chicken pot pie, shepherd pie, uh, shepherd's pie. Uh, Como is a direct-to-consumer while Bush is available at retail. I can go buy it around the corner where I live. Um, all looks really tasty. So actually my question for you, Anna, was, you know, with all these new food offerings and plant-based comfort foods, it feels like there's a middle ground now. We've We've been eating at home for a long time uh, during COVID and comfort food is still something I think we're going to want as we go back to our office. We're going to want it on demand. Um, how do you how do you use this stuff at your house? Like I look at this from a micro perspective. We know the trend towards plant based eating and, and less meat consumption in the household. But, um, you know, how are we going to implement this in our busy schedules? It seems to be the play here. Uh, and I'm wondering in your own household with your children and stuff how you're trying to integrate, you know, plant-based diet, or at least in, in spurts. So you're not eating meat every single day. Well, so, so that's a really good question. And, and I think um, maybe it'll, I'll give a different answer than what most people give. I'm a big fan of meat. I'm a big meat eater. We're big meat eaters in our house. Um, what I love about this trend coming is that it will allow someone like me, and I lo also love to cook. Um, this will allow me to start experimenting with it a little bit. You know, a chicken pot pie is something I can do on a on a weeknight with the kids, um, it does, it ticks off the box of having at least one night where we're not eating meat in the house. Yeah. Um, you know, we try and do fish as much as we can and chicken, but, um, you know, it, it definitely will tick off that box. Uh, we did a, a plant-based, um, forum and I had the honor of chatting with Tom Cox. He's a, he's an advisor at at um, Canaccord. And he was saying, you know, look, the next disruptor in this space is going to be the fast food and this ability to implement this stuff into your life in a quick and easy fashion without having to, um, you know, I remember when, when veggie burgers first came out, you had a recipe to make a veggie burger. I mean, you were grinding up mushrooms and putting all that stuff in. So I yeah. think this will be a big movement. I really do. Cause I feel tempted to go and implement this into my life and for being, you know, such a dedicated media dear, sorry. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's something that I would, I would, you know, integrate into my weekly routine. What yeah. about you? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned it today because I, I feel like you and I are directly the uh, the target customer for this. We're trying to get fast, healthy foods uh, on our tables. We want it to be edible, uh, not just for ourselves, but we know we have picky kids that aren't going to you know eat just anything we give them. Uh, but you know, you kind of get meat burnout. Like you're just <laughs> sitting there, and especially during the summer, you're barbecuing every day or whatever. Like at least I am, and and uh, you know, I'm certainly not a vegetarian. Uh, you kind of get burnt out. You just want to break from meat. Right. So that's kind of the, the happy middle ground I hope we find here uh, with one caveat. I hope and my hope and one thing I would suggest we all look at is as long as it's not over processed. Right. So we're trying to get stuff that hasn't been through too many machines as it gets to our bowl or table. And um, I think I've seen that in quite a few of these companies are very conscious of that. So. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll taste, see what happens. Yeah, taste. You know, these companies coming out with uh, the food better taste good because that's going to be that's going to make or break it. You know, I'm not that dedicated. So, and yep. I think that's where these comfort foods are really going to have a place in the market. So, welcome yep. to Como and is it Boosh? I think it's Boosh. Yeah, Boosh. Welcome, welcome, guys, <laughs> to the CSC family. Um, yeah, okay, let's let's talk Some about samples. esports. Yeah, I won't, I won't spend too much time on esports today. I, I put esports 2.0 as our, our title today. Um, what does that really mean to me? Uh, well, let me work backwards. We're going to be hosting an event on June, or sorry, July 15th uh, called Esports in the Capital Markets. This is part of our running capital market series at the CSE. 
Uh, and we're going to talk about the state of the industry in esports, uh, particularly how the investment world is looking at it, and also talk about esports and gambling. So, um, what I've noticed with a couple of companies that have listed recently, we've had quite a few in the esports space or in the gaming space. Uh, one is called Game On, and the other one is Alpha Sports. And and I'm just looking at what their their general philosophies are around con connectivity and bringing people into esports through you know interaction and. To me, eSports 2.0 is all about really taking the next st step in the space where as opposed to, say, a traditional sport like football or, you know, watching hockey like we do right now during the playoffs, it's a pretty binary experience. You sit there, you watch, you are either entertained or you walk away and do something else. And I think eSports is entering a phase with the technology, with the integration, with the focus of these companies where a lot of the people who are just watching, but they're not necessarily competing, can still participate either through gamification, uh, real-time, um, you know, uh, lotteries, competitions, gambling, obviously, or even passively playing alongside their favorite players, but in a way where they're not actually, you know, influencing the game per se. So um, that's that's how I see it. We're going to talk about a lot of that stuff. But if you want more detail or see companies that are actually working on these solutions, uh, which I consider again esports 2.0. Game on Alpha Sports, both listed on the CSE. Um, again, there's quite a few of them. We're going to be doing them again on July 17th or July 15th. Uh, so join us then. We'll send out details on our events page. Well, I one thing I have to say about that, and this isn't necessarily esports, but during this pandemic, I think I think like you you touched on it, that desire to have an experience as we've sit that sat there with our screens. My yeah. children, um, they go on to on to a game called Roblox, which I think went public as well. And um, they're on Roblox with their cousins across the border. So they actually get to have fun and play with their cousins, you know, with the borders closed and unable to see each other. Um, so I think esports might have a really big comeback, bigger than I would have expected when, you know, when this all comes back. Yeah, I mean, the things before pandemic, we're getting to like, you know, we're building arenas, we're going to bring fans into a physical yeah. space and and we're going to start sponsoring these players and these teams. And, and that's still happening for sure. Um, I just think the audience is still at home and it's going to continue to be at home watching on a screen and wanting to to find a way to stay engaged. And I, and I think that's the beauty of esports is that it's going to allow, because you know, again, the NFL and the NBA and all these people are finding second screen solutions for their product. But Esports just allows, just by design, a, a way for you to get deeper into the experience as a viewer so that you actually get something out of it as opposed to just sitting there watching and, you know, feeling like you're just <laughs> being force fed something. So uh, looking forward to that event and, uh, you know, sharing all that stuff with you guys. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to move on to some celebrity sightings that we're seeing <laughs> at the CSC. Um, I can't believe some of the names that we've mentioned. So um, hopefully you guys join us every week. Um, if you have missed any episodes, they're always available on CSC TV. But we've talked about Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about oh, um, uh, Venus, Venus Williams. Williams. Yeah. 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 Um, oh my God, there's a bunch of um, hockey players and NFL. There's a big list. <laughs> Yep. Remember them all. Um, but we saw a few this week. So I'm going to start off by talking about um, uh, Neurocene. Neurocene mm -hmm. came to live with us this week. I think they started trading on June 9th. Um, Neurocene uh, is an interesting company. It is implementing healthy habits designed to align the mind, body, and brain for daily mental wellness. So it's a, it's a mental wellness app. Um, they they went to go raise, I think, five to eight million and ended up oversubscribing to 9.2 million. So that's that's what they they went public with um, as part of their IPO. Um, they came to trade at about 90 cents. They're now trading today at 231. So good for you guys. I mean, it's it's so neat to see companies like this be in favor in the market. You know, I mean, I don't think we would have seen companies like this as in favor, you know, back in the days of, you know, when mining was really took over the junior space. So I really, I love seeing these kinds of stories um, really take favor in the market. And it reminds you, as we've talked today about plant-based foods and esports and, you know, this health and well-being, this is really reflective of the new investor that's come to the market. Um, these are, this is a younger generation. They care about the stuff. They want to be a part of the upside of this opportunity. Um, so good for them. They had, um, they have a celebrity who has joined their forces. Tell us about that. Yeah, Hall of Famer Richard Sherman. He's a cornerback. Uh, many people know him from his days in Seattle, uh, but he's now with San Francisco. Next season, we're not so sure yet, but 
Um, he's an ambassador and also an investor. He, he was in on the IPO and, and I think even before that. So um, obviously as a football player, he cited all of the issues that he's seen on the field as a player, um, you know, with, with CTE and, and just, you know, the mental health issues that can come from playing uh, a high velocity contact sport like football in the NFL. So he's, he's involved and, um, you know, he's a very intelligent guy. This is a guy that negotiated his own contracts, which often players don't do. Um, you know, well regarded for his intelligence, great analyst when he's on TV talking about the sport. So really excited. Hope we get a chance to meet Richard uh, through our travels here at CSE because I think he's a great ambassador for someone just like Dan Carcillo um, with uh, with Santa Health and, and the things he went through as a professional hockey player. So yeah, we'll just continue to see more athletes obviously get into the space. We've seen a lot of athletes uh, in the cannabis space. And then as you mentioned, Mike Tyson, who's also involved with uh, a psychedelics company as well. So it just, it just goes to show how seriously these people are taking, they're putting their own reputation and then their own, you know, uh, expertise and putting them into these companies. Cause I think they could really benefit from it. Well, this was so much fun, James. Thank you so much for jumping in and, and being my co-host this week. Um, you know, Bruce, if you ever want to take time off again, um, James, please come back. <laughs> my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Uh, hopefully I was at least a, uh, you know, somewhat decent replacement for Bruce this week. He's, he's great. So we look good. forward to having him back. <laughs> and thanks, Annie. You did a great job. Thank you, James. See you next Happy week. Happy five-year anniversary. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>